kinetics deals with how fast enzymes work. And these thing, kinetic schemes can get really, really complicated because you can be dealing with lots of different substrates and they can be, there's all these different steps and they're converted and all these things. And so we often simplify things by thinking in terms of Michaelis mending kinetics. Any sticks could stick snapper snap if a stick snapper could snap sticks. A stick snapper would snap all the sticks it could snap according to Michaelis mending kinetics. I debated whether or not to just remake this whole video or to try to revamp it, but I thought you might get a kick out of seeing baby Brie. Okay, well, maybe not that baby Brie. So I decided to leave parts of it in, um, revamp other parts, add new content. And so hopefully you'll forgive me for using some of my grad school content to help now. So if we have this example of a stick snapper, and now we want to say, okay, so our sticks would be something like our substrate. So this is the thing that an enzyme is going to act on. So our enzyme is going to bind to the substrate, and now you have an enzyme-substrate complex. The substrate, the enzyme is then going to break the substrate, do the easy part. The enzyme is then going to break the substrate, and now you have your products or products. And so we can define this relationship where we're talking about the concentrations of the enzyme, so the free enzyme, the free substrate, and the enzyme substrate complex, and the products. And by measuring these and also measuring the rate at which these products are being formed, we can tell information about the enzyme and how the enzyme is acting towards the substrate. And in the case of the stick snapper analogy, how much sticks you're snapping, so like how good you are at snapping a stick, is going to depend on how well you can bind that stick. So the affinity for the substrate. This is analogous, this is a value called the Km or the uh, Michaelis constant. So each enzyme is going to have a Km towards a particular substrate, and that represents, um, in the most simplistic way, how good it is at like binding it and how strongly it'll bind it, um, as opposed to just like letting it go um, or just like not grabbing onto it if it comes by. Then it's also going to depend on how well it can snap the stick. So every time it binds a stick, that's going. To, it's then going to be have the chance to snap it and to how well good it is at going and actually snapping it um that is defined by this like catalytic um rate constant k cat also called like the turnover number so how many sticks you end up snapping and how fast you're snapping these sticks is going to depend on things like how your the kms how well can you bind on to this and how well can you then turn it over? And so we can talk in terms of this Km and this Kcat in order to kind of talk about like how good an enzyme is towards a various substrate. And we can get information about these by measuring the enzyme kinetics. So by measuring like the speed. So kinetics is referring to speed and the speed at which the reaction happened, the reaction rates are going to depend on those constants, the Km and the Kcat, as well as concentration. So they're going to depend on things like the concentration of substrate because the more substrate you have, then the um, the less the Km is going to matter, and the less substrate you have, the more the Km is going to matter. And in either case, the amount of substrate you have is going to influence the amount, um, the rate of the reaction. And then the final rate of the reaction is going to depend on how many of the stick snappers that you have in there. So it's going to depend on the amount of your sticks and so the substrate concentration, as well as the amount of stick snappers, so the enzyme concentration, those are going to influence your final maximum velocity, the fastest speed that you can work at. So um, this Vmax. And so the Vmax is kind of representing if you had a whole group of stick snappers. And super importantly, as we'll get into, to get the Vmax, you need to have a high concentration of your substrate so that you have every enzyme has its maximum possibility. It's not getting held up by not having enough substrate. So it's not like you running out of substrate. And so when we're actually measuring um, the maximum velocity, we're getting it first. We take, a, we take a whole range of concentrations and this is also um, of substrate concentration. So we're doing individual uh, velocity measurements and then we're going to graph those and use those to find um, this Vmax. Um, but so the Vmax is like the maximum speed that you can work at. You take a timer, go. We'll talk about some of the um, 
some of the assumptions we have to make and some of the time constraints that we have to work with so that we're in like the steady state. Um, but if we do this and then we say, okay, take the amount of sticks that were formed, that were broken, and then we'll look at the time, we get this idea of this Vmax, so this maximum velocity. And then if we were to divide that by the number of snappers, we would get our k cats, so our turnover number. So like the goodness of the speed at which like a single enzyme copy is working, whereas the overall rate is going to depend on how many of those enzymes we have. So how many stick snappers are actually snapping the sticks, that's going to influence how many sticks get snapped. But at some, you're also going to be limited by your substrate concentration because if you have more stick snappers than you have sticks to snap, then you're going to run out of sticks. And so it doesn't matter if you add any more of your snappers, you're going to reach this plateau. And you're also going to reach a plateau if you have too many sticks to snap. And so basically in that case, you're going to saturate your enzyme. So each enzyme, there's way more sticks than enzymes. And so no matter how many more sticks you add, you can't speed up. And so by taking these examples where we have a really low substrate concentration or we have a really high substrate concentration or we have a really low enzyme concentration or we have a really high enzyme concentration we can use these extremes to kind of simplify the mathematical equations that we're going to use and the mathematical equations that we're going to use are these michaelis menten equations one of the key concepts that's going to come out is that the km that michaelis constant that we're talking about in terms of how like that affinity for the substrate um, it's mainly the affinity. There's also some other like complicating factors, but um, you can think of it as like the affinity for a substrate. It's similar to, but not the same as KD. So KD, the dissociation constant, that's when we're talking about like bind things binding and unbinding and binding and unbinding. When we have the KM, we have to think about things binding and unbinding, and then also things binding and then being snapped. So being turned into product. And we have this constant called the KM. Work out mathematically is equal to the the concentration of substrate at which you have your half maximal velocity. And so because the remember the half maximal velocity is go, the maximal velocity is going to depend on how many six snappers you have but the constants are going to stay constant. This KM is going to stay constant. So the affinity isn't going to change if you have changed your number of sticks. And similarly, the KCAT isn't going to change if you change your sticks or the number of your enzymes. These are constant things about the enzyme and about the system. And so about like in these certain conditions with this substrate and this enzyme, these will remain constant even if you change those other things. And so by taking into account um, these factors, we can then determine these constants if we take the same enzyme concentration and we do a range of values of substrate concentrations and measure velocities and then we can plot these out and when we do this we'll see that there's going to be a substrate concentration at which we have a half maximal velocity and this doesn't matter what type what your concentration of enzyme is as well as I mean like unless you're at like really extremes. So this is your KM is going to be constant. So you can measure out of any enzyme concentration, but different concentrations of substrates, and you get this curve. And these are the curves that we see on these michaelis menten kinetic graphs. In this curve, you have a plateau where you run out of the, where you have too many sticks, you have more sticks than snappers, way more sticks than snappers, you reach this plateau where you're at your maximal velocity. And the concentration that it took you to get to that half maximal velocity, half of that maximal velocity, that is going to be your KM. If you have a higher affinity, that KM is going to be lower. It's going to take you less of the substrate to actually get to that um, halfway point. If so, something that has a higher, an enzyme that has like a higher affinity, so like a better is going to be a lower KM. But the actual velocity is going to then depend also on how fast you're snapping the sticks and how well you can actually turn the sticks over from have, like grabbing them to actually turning them into your product. And so this is going to be the turnover, the catalytic rate constant. And so that's going to be your like your K cat. And so you can then get the K cat by dividing the maximal velocity by the concentration of the enzyme that you were using in your assay. So sometimes you also see this thing called the specificity constant, which is the K cat over the KM. Sometimes you might see it called like the catalytic coefficiency, but this can be misleading. Um, it's really, it's, um, I'll tell you more about this and how like, but basically it can be misleading if you're trying to use it to compare different enzymes, but you can use it to compare the same enzyme with different substrates and see which ones it prefers. So 
I'll tell you about all of this. Um, also some various caveats, um, things like this, as well as things like you might um, be introduced to Langweaver Burke plots, um, which have some problems um, that I'll talk about, as well as the fact that you have to be measuring in very specific conditions to equations to actually work, and that not all enzymes are actually going to obey Michaelis mentin kinetics. You can have things like allosteria, like we see with hemoglobin binding, oxygen, where like binding to one subunit influences binding to another, and you can have all these complicated enzymatic schemes. But at the end of the day, um, for simple reactions, we can take this stick snapper analogy and put it to use. So this is a typical type of graph that you'll see when you're talking about Michaelis mentin um, kinetics. And so in this case, you have a constant concentration of your enzyme and you're changing the concentration of the substrate. And then you're plotting um, the initial rate of product formation, the B naught. And so each of these is representing a separate experiment that you did. And these experiments that you're doing, there you're measuring the velocity. So when we're talking about velocity, we're talking about the rate of product formation over time. And we'll talk more about how we actually calculate this rate and how these fits into um, how we're getting these constants that we're going to get. But the key thing is that in order to get those initial velocities, we have to do a bunch, a bunch of experiments. And so we have to take an enzyme and we have to change the product concentration, and then we have to measure the formation of the product. A key thing is that we need to measure the velocity when we're in this steady state. We'll talk more about this steady state later um, because the steady state assumption is important for how we understand and how we're able to make simplifications when we're doing our calculation. In terms of mathematically, the steady state is telling us that this enzyme substrate, con this enzyme, the concentration of this enzyme substrate is going to stay constant so that every time the rate at which the, it's formed is the same as the rate at which it is, I, is um unformed. And so it can be unformed by either just releasing it or by changing it into the product. And so the steady state assumption is that this is going to stay constant. By steady state, we're referring to it's kind of like an equilibrium, but not. So at equilibrium, all of this would kind of, all the concentrations of all of these various things would have to be um, would have to be constant on net, and we would have like a closed system where nothing is like being added or removed. Typically, um, we're like for here, we're dealing with a steady state. So this is staying constant, but the concentrations of these are changing. And so we can have different concentrations of our substrate. So we can be losing the substrate and gaining the product, but this is staying constant. And so we have this steady state where this is staying constant. And this is going to be important for simplifying our michaelis mentin kinetic constants. So there's actually a little bit before this early part, um, and this is called the pre-steady state. And so with the pre-steady state, um, basically the, where the enzyme grabs up the substrate, so there's plenty to go around, but there's not much breaking going on because you have to actually like pick up the things. Um, and then you have to, so the enzymes are kind of like finding the sticks to break, but then they get into their flow. And so in the steady state, the enzymes are doing the grab, break, grab, break, grab, break without having to worry about running off, about running out. And so remember, they're also, in addition to doing the breaking, they could also be doing the dropping, but then there's another one that they can pick back up. Um, and so there's no concern about running out. But eventually you reach this post-steady state where you're running out of sticks to break. Um, and so you, your free enzyme concentration starts to go up and your, um, your bound enzyme goes down and you're not making product anymore because, so this is cumulative product form. So you reach this plateau. And so you wanna take the slope of this linear part before it plateaus. And this is going to be your initial velocity, the V naught. Um, and so this is not the plateau that we're going to talk about when we're finding V max. This is just like the plateau at this one concentration of um, substrate. When we're talking about our Vmax, that's going to correspond to running out of um, out of like the enzyme as opposed to running out of the substrate. So here we're running out of the substrate and here we're running out of the enzyme. So we have more substrate than we have enzyme. And that is why we're plateauing here. And here we're plotting each of these different V0s from your different reactions. And we're figuring out the Vmax. And this Vmax is going to be a property that is going to come 
from this include the KM and the KCAT, and it's also going to involve um, the enzyme concentration, whereas the KM is not going to depend on the concentration of your enzyme. And so no matter what concentration of enzyme you, you measured at, um, assuming that it's within reasonable ranges and you're not in weird situations, then you're going to have this in the, um, this V max is going, the half point is going to be um, equal to your KM, the substrate concentration at which you reach that half maximum velocity. But your maximum velocity, if you had a higher, um, if you had a higher um, like enzyme concentration, your Vmax would be higher, but so would your half Vmax. And so you're still going to be at the concentration. So you could think of kind of just like stretching this up. And so this is going to then allow us to figure out these things. And note that here we can, when we're talking about velocity, we're going to be talking about, we can talk about the velocity at any one point. And so this is the velocity at any one point. And here you can see that it does matter, the substrate concentration does matter. But when we're talking about the maximum velocity, then the substrate concentration doesn't matter because basically you run out, when you reach a point where you're at the maximum and you can add more substrate and it's not going to influence anything. Um, but in either case, you're going to have this KM matter. And so let's talk more about what this KM actually is. So first, where does it come from? This work was carried out. It was published in 1913 by Leonard Michaelis and Maud Menton. It was published in German, but they did a translation of it in English. Um, so Johnson and Goody, um, this is a Goody article. Um, they do this translation and also kind of like a modern day interpretation of it. Um, so really good stuff. But I always like to bring up Maud Menton because not many equations are named after women. And so it's nice to have one of the most important equations in biochemistry come in part from a woman. And she's a phenomenal woman at, at that. So now let's dive into this equation that they came up with. So I'm not going to make you actually derive the michaelis menten equation, but I do really highly recommend that you derive the michaelis menten equation because I think it's really helpful to figure out kind of where things are coming from and see where this is all coming from. And if you want to derive it, I have a video on how to derive it and things like this. But for now, just know that the michaelis menten connect michaelis menten equation is coming down to these rate constants. You have your k-cat, your k-on, your k-off. And the rate constants, remember, these are going to be different from your rate. So the rate, this is going to come from those rate constants and the concentration. Similarly to how when we talked about like thermodynamics of binding, of equilibrium binding thermodynamics and stuff, and we we're talking about like KD, and we talked about how we had those rate constants, our K on and our K off. But the actual rate of your binding is going to depend on the concentration. So you had to multiply that by your concentrations. Similarly, the velocity that we're going to see is going to depend on those rate constants, but then those rate constants, well, that's what we talk about with our beam, with our, like our k-cat. So our k-cat is a rate constant, whereas the velocity is going to be a rate. So rate versus rate constant, it's really important to keep those that distinction in mind. So remember the steady state assumption that's kind of like when we talk about equilibrium thermodynamics. And we say that we get to this point where the rate of the binding is equal to the rate of the unbinding, not the rate constants, but the rates. Similarly, when we talk about the steady state assumption with the michaelis menten equation, we're saying that the rate of substrate binding to the enzyme is the same as the rate it either unbinds or gets converted into product. And we make these conditions where the steady state assumption is fairly reasonable, where we're measuring in the early beginning, we've got plenty of substrate, we don't have enough product building up that makes things go backwards or causes weird things. So we can make the steady state assumption that the substrate binding to the enzyme happens at the same rate. It either binds, uh, it either unbinds or gets converted into product. And remember rate, not rate constants. Another kind of the key things that comes from deriving the michaelis menten equation, other than just the joy of mathematics, is that it helps you see why we can kind of rearrange things and simplify things to talk about any velocity in terms of the V max. And the way that we can do this is by making this ass assumption that the total amount of enzyme is equal to the amount of enzyme bound substrate. 
And we can only make that assumption when we have a large excess of substrate. When we have such a large excess of substrate, then the enzyme is going to be able to work at its Vmax. And in this case, then we take our E total is equal to the ES. Then we could talk about the velocity at any time in terms of the Vmax um, and the Km, rather than having to kind of figure out what proportion of the enzyme is actually substrate bound versus what proportion is free. If we know what purport, what how much enzyme we put in, then we can basically figure out figure out these things. So we say that we can bind to Kcat by dividing the max by the enzyme concentration. A slight technicality is that well, technically that's your enzyme substrate concentration, not your amount of enzyme, like free enzyme or total enzyme. But we can make this assumption that all of the enzyme is going to be bound to substrate if we have a ton of substrate. And therefore, we can say that Kcat is going to equal the Vmax divided by the enzyme concentration, the total enzyme concentration, that is, not just divided by the enzyme substrate concentration, because we are saying those are the same thing. And by making the steady state assumption, we're also saying that that ES is going to stay constant in the in the time at which we are measuring the velocity. So in these ways, we can kind of go back and forth between V, Vmax, Kcat, and Km. So voila, the math all works out nice, and now don't worry about it. So we have the situation where the enzyme finds a substrate. You get this enzyme substrate complex. Now the enzyme is going to trans form that into an enzyme product complex because basically it takes it, makes a product, it's holding on to that product, and it lets the product go. Now, when we do talk about Mikhail's kinetics, we make some simplifications. We say we're going to basically ignore the fact that the product could theoretically return to be a substrate. We're going to say we're not going to have enough, we're going starting in the very beginning, we're measuring velocity at the very beginning, there's not going to be enough product even like go backwards. We're gonna consider that there's also not gonna be a product to bind. So it's gonna like, the release is not gonna be really rate limiting. The product isn't gonna do something weird like inhibit. We're talking simplifications. So we take an enzyme, we give it as much substrate as it needs and we measure its velocity. That's how we're gonna be doing these Kellis-Mentine kinetics. And that's how we're going to figure out kind of how good the enzyme is. So we're gonna simplify things. We ignore that enzyme product complex. We ignore the fact that it's reversible to go to the from the ES to the EP. And we consider that the rate limiting step is going to be this KCAT. It's going to be the kind of, we're gonna combine the enzyme to product and the, enzyme, the product release in this one thing. And this is all kind of gonna be encompassed by our KCAT. So if we think about this, kind of just lumping them together and calling it the KCAT. So the Kcat is going to be our turnover, where we're going from the enzyme substrate to the enzyme in the release product. So again, it's a simplification, but we can make this simplification for a couple of reasons. One is that we do these measurements of velocity in the very beginning, or not the very, very beginning, once the enzyme like has enough time to find things. But then we have this condition where the enzyme can be working and the product is not going, there's not going to be enough product that it could like go backwards. So the product isn't going to like, the enzyme can't find product to bind. And then if it can't find product to bind, it can't reverse the bot product binding. Um, and we're going to consider that's not going to really reverse the product binding otherwise, or the product formation otherwise. So we're going to simplify that all. Now we can consider that our rate limiting step is going to be this turnover. And so this is going to be our KCAT. The KCAT, this is like how fast one copy of the enzyme is working. You typically don't have one copy of the enzyme. You've got lots of copies of the enzyme. And so when you're in the lab and you're measuring your enzyme, instead of measuring like that single enzyme and how fast it's working, you're going to be measuring just like the velocity of how much all the enzymes in the mixture are working. That's going to give you your velocity. And if you vary the substrate concentration so that you get to that point where the con where the enzyme has is not limited by substrate. So it has as much substrate as it needs, so every enzyme can get as much as it wants. You're going to reach your maximum velocity, your Vmax. The con substrate concentration that it takes to do this is your Km. The more substrate you need in order to reach that, the weaker the affinity. Basically, it's saying that although there's a lot of sticks around, 
you don't really want to grab that much or them that much, or if you grab them, you let go pretty quick. And so you're going to need to keep running into those sticks um, and kind of have them forced down your throat or forced into your hands and kept there in order for you to do things. And so your KM is going to be higher if you have weaker bonding. But if you're up tighter binding, you're basically, even if there aren't that many sticks around, you're snapping them up. And so your KM is going to be lower. This is just like we saw with our KV in terms of directionality, but there's an extra complication with our KM because you also have that. It is influenced by that, that um, turnover to product. So the KM is not independent and it's not just about affinity, but we consider it a measurement of affinity as a simplification. Remember that when we're looking at one of these blocks, plots, what we're looking at here is you're looking at substrate concentration versus product formation. You're looking at a Vmax graph, not looking at one of those time graphs. So when you're looking at a time graph, what's going to happen here is that you have a single substrate concentration. And here your plateau is going to be where you, your plateau is when you, when you run out of your substrate. Whereas in the, this kind of graph, you're kind of running out of enzyme and the fact that all your enzyme is kind of being used up. And that is going to be your plateau in one of these Michaelis mending graphs. And in the when you have one of these single graphs, this is like time, Michaelis mending graph, your x-axis is your substrate concentration. Note that KM is coming from this Michaelis mending graph, and it does not depend on the substrate concentration. It's kind of like the substrate concentration at which you have something happens, at which you have that half maximal velocity. So why is this? What is happening that is special when you have the K uh, M equal to one half of the V max? So the V is just like any velocity, like your velocity under these conditions. And then your V max is going to be the maximum velocity, which remember we get when we run out of, um, when we're basically saturated our enzyme. So each enzyme is working at its maximum capacity. And then the, what happens if our velocity, so what we're actually measuring in these conditions is equal to the half of the maximum velocity. When we do this, we put in half max, half of V max for our V. Now these are going to cancel out. And then you just do a little math and rearranging things. And you get that the KM now is equal to the substrate concentration. So this is saying that why the KM is going to be the concentration at which you get half of your V max. And so the, the better, the, the lower the KM, the less substrate is going to take you to get to that point. How much those individual enzymes like to bind the substrate is not going to depend on how much substrate there is around. So the KM is not going to depend on the substrate concentration. And the K-cat isn't going to depend on the substrate concentration. How much of the substrate you have is not going to influence how quickly an enzyme can convert that substrate to product. The only thing that is going to depend on your substrate concentration is going to be your velocity. And so that's why you can measure the velocity at a bunch of different substrate concentrations. And this is going to give, let you find your um, michaelis mentin constants. And note that here, what you're seeing too, is that you want to measure the velocity at this very beginning point, or not, not this kind of like burst state where things are trying to just find each other, but in this steady state part. And basically steady state where you have the enzymes doing that grab break, grab break, grab break without having to worry about, without having to worry about running out. And then you enter that post steady state where you start to run out. And so we don't want to measure here. We want to measure right here in this linear range. An important thing too is that because this we're in the steady state zone, remember we're saying that the rate of binding is equal to the rate of either dropping it or converting it to product. So it's not always just going to grab and convert to product. Sometimes it's going to drop it. And basically the lower the affinity, the more frequently it's going to be dropping it. And so this is why you can have, you'll have these different velocities at this different substrate concentration because the enzyme has to both, has to bind it efficiently, effectively. It has to have this like productive binding or in order to convert it to a product. So in all these cases, because you're at the very beginning, there's enough substrate that the enzyme isn't going to run out until like later we're in the zone where it's not gonna run out of the substrate. But the lower the substrate concentration is, the harder it is for it to be able to like 
um, get enough of that productive binding to have a higher activity. So remember, you're thinking about kind of like productive binding. We've got to bind and convert. And what we're measuring here in this linear range is going to be our V naught or the, your V zero. Sometimes you see it um, called the V zero, but it's um, the V naught. And then you plot all those V naughts. And then the point at which you're at that half max is going to be your KN. And if you take that, um, that maximum, that where the point at which it plateaus, and you divide that by your enzyme concentration, you're going to get your K cat. If you want to think about kind of like how good an enzyme is for a substrate, we need to consider both the KM and the KCAT. We have a value that does this, and this is called the specificity constant. It's sometimes called the catalytic efficiency, and it's the KCAT over the KM. So why do we call it the catalytic efficiency? Well, think about your car. If you want an efficient car, it's going to be able to go a long way and a little bit of get with a little bit of gas and not have much waste left over. Similarly, we want our enzyme to be able to make a little product in without having to have extra waste, and we want it to do it fast and all this great stuff. So we want to take into account the KCAT and the KM. So remember that if our KM is higher, what that's meaning, that's like weaker binding. And if our KCAT is higher, well, that's like better turnover. So if we look at the specificity constant, we have the KCAT over the KM. So if we have weak binding, we're going to have a big KM, and that's going to make our specificity constant lower. Whereas if we had tight binding, KM would be smaller, and that would make our specificity constant bigger. What about our KCAT? Well, if we're better at turning things over, our KCAT's going to be bigger. If our KCAT's bigger, since it's on the top, our specificity constant is going to be bigger as well. So we can use this term KCAT over KM. And it's really good if you are trying to um, analyze the same enzyme with different substrates, but it's not so good if you're trying to like compare different enzymes. So it can be a bit misleading in that regard. And I'm not going to um, like make you go into why or anything like that. Um, just know that the specificity constant can be used to kind of compare an enzyme with how good it is for one substrate versus how good it is for another substrate. So say it likes one substrate better than the other because it binds one substrate better than the other. Well, what would happen was the one that bound tighter would have, a low, would have a lower KM. If the KM was lower, the specificity constant would get higher. If an enzyme was better with this one substrate because it could turn it over faster, well, then what would happen is your KCAP for that substrate would be bigger, and therefore your specificity constant for that substrate would be bigger. This um this value is should be used cautiously um and not be like overinterpreted. And it's important to look at both the KCAT and the KM when you are thinking about how an enzyme works. Another couple of words of caution. Um, and so um not all enzymes are going to follow Michaelis Menten kinetics. Um, and so sometimes you might see enzymes that instead they of showing just like that nice um simple plateau, you see something where you have something curvier, and this can be indicative of like cooperative action of some sort, such as you see with hemoglobin, where binding, hemoglobin has these four binding sites for oxygen, and once one binds, um, then the, it influences the binding of the others, um, and so you get this curved shape line. Speaking of the shape of lines, so we vary the substrate concentration and get the initial velocities from that steady state zone. Then we plot the, those initial velocities against the substrate concentration to find our kinetic constants. The Km is going to be the concentration that gets us to the half V max, and then our Kcat is going to be that V max divided by our enzyme concentration. So it might seem kind of simple, like you just look at this graph, you see where, where it kind of plateaus, and then you take the halfway mark. But it's actually kind of harder than that to figure out like where exactly it's going to plateau and things. So typically we use a nonlinear regression in order to fit to a curve to the line following the michaelis menten equation. You can do this with the software like GraphPad Prism as well as some free alternatives. In the olden days, and they're still used a lot, but they were used a lot more before we had such sophisticated nonlinear regression tools. There's this thing called the line weaver blurb Burke plot. Basically, what you do here is instead of doing substrate against your velocity, you are doing one over substrate against one over velocity. This is going to give you a line, and the intercepts of the line are going to tell you things. So you are going to the minus one over km. This is going to be your x-intercept, 
And then one over V max is going to be your Y intersect. Problem with these, with these is that points that are far from the origin. So when you have, um, so remember this is one over substrate. So if you have a really small amount of substrate, it's gonna be big. So when you have a really low amount of, um, when you have a really small amount of substrate, it's gonna be a big number over here. These ones over here are going to kind of be, if you think of physics and like kind of a lever, those would be kind of pulling your, pulling your curve and they can have a big impact. And because you're doing such small substrate concentrations, they're also often sources of large error. So these can be a problem. Where they can come in really handy is for trying to figure out what type of inhibition you're using. And so we'll talk about inhibition later, but inhibition, they're basically different types of inhibition and they lead different types of evidence. And they can either change your apparent um, affinity or change your velocity. And so you can kind of, because we can see those points on these graphs, we can then see those evidence in the in these line weaver Burke plots of these different types of inhibitors. But you can also use um, nonlinear regression to figure out types of inhib enzyme inhibition as well. A final note is that when we talk about enzymes, we often talk in terms of activity units. An activity unit is basically whatever people define it to be. And so it has to be it's like under these specific conditions, then like this buffer or whatever, this amount, this activity corresponds to like the conversion of one mole of blah, blah, blah to one mole of blah, blah, blah in blah, blah, blah minutes or something. And so you have this specific, this specific kind of thing that defines the unit, but it can be different. It will, it has to be different for different enzymes because different enzymes do the same, different things. So if you have a stick snapper, it would be like it snaps, this much stick snapped in this many minutes. Whereas if you have a tile layer, it would be this many tiles laid in this many minutes. That is their activity. It's kind of like a measure of just like how much stuff gets done. So the more work that gets done, the more activity you can say it has. But what about like how many and how much enzyme it actually took to do that activity? Well, that gets to a term called your specific activity, where you divide the activity by the amount of total protein. So basically you're dividing it by mixed protein. And what's gonna happen now is that if you don't have a lot of, you don't need a lot of protein, you're gonna have a really high specific activity. But if you need a lot of protein, you're gonna have a really low specific activity. And well, why might you need, why might you have a lower versus a higher? Well, some of that comes down to how pure your enzyme is. So if you say, had 20 workers come and they got the job done and you had then you find out that only 10 of the, the workers were stick snappers well then the enzyme would be um, better than you kind of thought it was but your purity was going to be lower and so ultimately you're going to have that your specific activity is going to be lower because your solution is less pure and so you're going to need kind of more workers to get the same amount of things done even though most of those workers weren't actually your enzyme. So your specific activity could be lower because your thing is impure, or it could be lower because your enzyme is kind of worse. But if you're taking the same enzyme, it should have the sp same specific activity unless the enzymes have different purities. And so you can compare specific activity between like different en enzyme preps or between a wild type and a mutant and things like this um, in order to compare activities but you don't want to compare just the activity, you want to compare the specific activity because the activity is going to depend on the concentration of your enzyme. This is similar to how we saw that the velocity was going to depend on the enzyme concentration. 